Dadage's friends and family, we're back for part two of a touching interview with Susan Combs regarding her book, Pancakes for Roger, a mentorship guide for slaying dragons. The discussion is based upon my dad's favorite dadage, to thine own self be true. If you missed part one, please click back and check it out. If you're current with dadages, stick around and we'll pick up where we left off. Susan was talking about how she stepped in after her father's passing and provided the framework for her entire family to move forward and go on with life without her father, Roger. Let's get back to it. I also want to go back and talk a little bit, and I really want to get some more perspective and maybe some direct advice from you on an area that I can relate to uh, very closely, which is the idea of being a caregiver and working with your parents through these, these late stages in life. I'm dealing with that personally right now, but I think my process may be a lot more protracted because I'm dealing with a mother who's not suffering from physical ailments, but is moving from the early to middle stages of dementia brought on by Alzheimer's. And so she's these moments of confusion that you talk about when your father was dealing with oxygen depletion, that's her all day, every day. And stepping in to to deal with these things for her, she, just like your father, was really proactive a decade ago and put in place a long-term care policy for herself. As someone who's been through it and also as someone who has a career in insurance, we're really struggling with that right now. We can't get the long-term care policy to actually pay for anything. We've been working for a year and we're really struggling to get any claims paid for any of the caregiving and support that we've needed, even after she had knee surgery and was really debilitated during that time period. Without getting into too much of the the conundrum and the, the doldrums of all of this, Can you give kind of a little bit of perspective for people like me and others that may be contending with these types of procedural things and dealing with insurance companies as to how we might do better? Yeah, you got to read the policy. I mean, policies have changed a lot. So usually like to trigger a long-term care, somebody has to be at minimum. If they're on hospice, that's an automatic like, like they'll qualify you immediately and there's no waiting period on hospice, typically on most policies. But when it's something like this, usually it has to be somebody needs help with at least two of the activities of daily living. So continence, dressing, feeding, driving, you know, all those things where, and so, and a lot of times there might be some policies that say that the person has to be homebound. And so it's just like, you really have to understand the policies because that's the thing. I mean, it's just like if somebody's buying a policy online, you could get a lemon and not even know you got a lemon um, until it's too late. And that's really unfortunate. So I always tell people to find a broker, not an agent. Um, And the reason for that is an agent represents the carrier. The agent is always going to sell like their own stuff and that's it. But a broker at the end of the day, they don't care yeah, yeah. what policy you go They're with. They want to be the, about the carrier. Yeah. Yeah. They, they want to do the best thing for you. And, yeah. you know, in my experience, it's just like, I mean, everybody's different when it comes to this world and like on the insurance side, and there's, there's a lot of bad brokers out there. I'm not going to lie, but it's just, we found one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, and I don't want to be like a, a man versus woman type of thing, but I will tell you the female brokers that I know, we don't care about the commissions. We care about doing the right thing for the client. And so we know when we do the right thing for the client, the money will come. Yeah. And so and confess, it, I don't know. I, yeah. until this moment, I didn't understand the distinction between yeah. a broker and an agent. Well, so why would you? It's not your world. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 And, and I will go back and evaluate, but it kind of may be too late because, you know, we're down the road on this particular yeah. policy and where she's at right now, I don't know if we can cancel the policy and get a new one and start. You over. won't because it'll be pre-existing yeah, um, exactly. on long-term care. Exactly. Yeah. Well, so. and it's just, I mean, but also too, I would talk to the broker that set it up and get them to be yeah. your advocate and kind of fight. Well, that was the problem is this guy presented himself as our best friend and an expert, and he really knew how to navigate the system. And it turned out the guy was just totally incompetent, didn't know anything he was doing, and actually probably slowed us down six months before we just got him out of the picture. And I started dealing directly with the home office for the insurance company. But, you know, these things, when you're dealing in the- Yeah, you don't know what you don't know. With reimbursement or dealing with insurance- I had a Stanford professor who used to say, insurance is something that none of us can afford to be without, but none of us can afford to use. 
uh, and really highlighted that challenge of trying to find a good relationship with an insurance company that you can yeah. actually rely upon and count upon, count on and know that they're going to be there for you when when you need them versus them just uh, cashing your checks every month. Yeah, I know. We always say you want to pay your premium and never need it. But it's just like, yeah. but then when you need it, you want it to work. So yeah. that's that's the thing. I mean, it's just like I, we always say, like, you know, you can buy a policy A or policy B. Policy A is going to cover you. It's going to be more expensive, but it's going to do what you need it to do. Policy B is basically worth the piece of paper it's written on. And we don't sell policy yeah. B. You know, a lot of times, I mean, especially when it comes to like with our clients, like I always say, I, you know, I always treat the client how I would want to be treated. And I treat their business as if it was my own because, or their parents as if they were my own, because if the last thing you want to do is when you need it, not have it work. So I will say, yeah. you know, with long-term care policies, there is always a waiting limit or, you know, waiting yeah. period. So for example, like if your mother came out of the hospital for a knee surgery, there might've been a 90 day waiting period on it and 90 days, then you don't need the care anymore. anymore. So it's kind of a catch yeah. 22. Yeah. Think of long-term care more as like facility. Well, and we're going to be arriving at that point, probably on a one to two year time frame where she'll be moving yeah. from home care to an assisted living facility. And hopefully, as you said, it gets more straightforward. At, at yeah. Point. And it usually like it, um, a lot of times you'll do like a daily rate on long term care policies, $300 yeah. a day, $600 a day, you know, what have you type yeah. of thing. Uh, yeah, definitely look at that. And then I would also speak to, do you have a trust set up for her yet? Yes. Uh, she, again, she had a lot of foresight and she did a lot of things to set things up well it just hasn't been as easy as you might hope. And I mean, the perspective I would share for the sake of anyone else and the friends and families contending with things like this is that every institution you're going to deal with has their own set of rules for dealing with these things. If you're dealing with the bank, if you're dealing with the mortgage company, if you're dealing with the social security system, having a power of attorney, having a medical surrogate, none of these things are exactly as reliable as you might think they're supposed to be. And it takes a lot of endeavoring and massaging and maneuvering to comply with everyone's regulations and dealing with it. And it's just simply a lot of time. Well, and the other thing I will say is the power of attorney dies with the person. If you don't get yourself, you know, as an adult child on your parents, on the, you know, as a, like, for example, like my mother's trust. So it was, my father set up the trust. And then after my father died, then I became co-trustee because then there's a backup. Um, so you got to have that backup because if you don't have the backup, you're screwed. And I mean, the thing I tell people also is have all the passwords. If you don't do anything else, have all the passwords, get your parents on a password locker that you have that password for the password locker. And they tell you when they change the password, <laughs> the password locker. Yeah, we spent we spent an entire month recovering and resetting. Yeah. Every but also your pa power of attorney. Make sure it also pertains to social media if your parents are on social media, mm. because a lot of them Very don't. And that's kind of a new thing that I've seen get put yeah. more and more in power yeah. of attorneys. Because you know, if you need to shut down your mom's Facebook page, you know, things like that. Yeah. It's the stuff that you never yeah. thought about. Yeah, I have friends who have passed, yeah. and you still see their LinkedIn page three, four years later, and it's yeah, uh, yeah. Awesome. Yeah. See, and my dad's got shut down and I was kind of upset about it, but it's like he had a Wikipedia page. So it's like Wikipedia basically said, Hey, he's dead. And so Facebook was like, they pulled the information and then they shut it down. Dang it. Like I, cause I was, if I'd known that I, cause I thought I still had time and I didn't have time and it got shut yeah. down like within six months. So. Wow. wow. That one's surprising. I, there's not much logic yeah. behind that because there are plenty of oh, I know. people who have passed centuries ago and have Wikipedia pages. I mean, my grandfather, like, or no, my, my uncle, my uncle passed away five years before my dad did, or a year, yeah, a year before my dad did, and his is still active, but he didn't have a Wikipedia page like my dad, I guess. So. Wow. Well, this has been a great segue into host help, as I call it. I really appreciate you providing me with this input and guidance, and I hope that some of the things we talked about are, are beneficial to members of the friends and family as well. I want to turn back to the book now because it deserves our attention. It's a beautiful book, very well put together. I love the way that you effectively capture all of these pithy, memorable bits of wisdom from your father and from others you've gathered over the years, as you said, and then present them in context with stories from your own life, which I think is so valuable, and then also help your readers kind of determine how they can apply those bits of wisdom to, to their lives. It's in a way pretty similar to what we do here at Datages. Uh, Roger was certainly full of some amazing Datages of his own. And we won't go through all of them here today because I really think the friends and family would enjoy reading or listening. I love the audiobook; It was great in its entirety. And, and it's a great opportunity for them to, to get it directly from you in the format that, that you wanted to share it with the world. But let's just take a little bit of time 
to get into a couple of my favorite bits of wisdom in the book. So one of the things that I love, and you talk about structure, and one of the great structures or frameworks that you put forth in the book is talk about navigating the three facets of life. Can you break that down for the friends and family and what that means? I graduated college in 2001, but 2001, I mean, if you remember pre 9 11, it was a sick job market. I mean, it's just like, if you were good and you had experience, you could, I had eight job offers out of college. Like, and it was, it was fantastic. And so I, my dad brought me out to the Northeast because for whatever reason I got into my head, I wanted to go to New York. And so I had job offers in New York and Boston, DC and Connecticut. And so my dad said, let's go, let's go and like, look at these properties and stuff like that. And we would stay, like we stayed at the, the submarine base in new London, Connecticut. And it was a nor'easter and uh, which a nor'easter for the West coast and middle, middle America people. It's just, it's like a little mini hurricane and it's just like rains and rains and rains. And it's just like, you can't even see, and it's so much wind and they shut down the subways when it gets really bad. And so my dad was making me drive in the nor'easter and he's like, Suze, this is going to be your life. This is going to be your life. Drive the car, drive the car. But when we were driving, you know, from Connecticut to New York and everything, we just had some of those really good conversations. And my dad said, you know, Susan, he's like, when you think about life, he said, it really kind of boils down to like three facets. He was just like, he said, you have the person that you're with, you have the thing that you do for a living and you have the place that you live. He said, if you can be happy with three out of three, he said, you're living a golden life. He said, even if you're happy with two out of three, you're doing pretty good. But he said, if you're happy with one or none of these things, he said, only you are the one that can get off your ass and do something about it. So it's been something that's always resonated with me, always stuck with me. When I mentor people and people are bitching and moaning about their job and their husband and their house, I'm like, okay, that's a negative three. Let's, let's figure out something else. So it's one of those things that it really is that simple. I mean, doesn't mean that there's not whatever personal growth and all this lovey dovey shit too, but it's just like, but at the end of the day, when you think about like those three legged stools, that really is your foundation, right? Because like I said before, I mean, the person you pick to spend your life with makes you better or worse every single day. I cast a big shadow. I mean, I just do. I mean, I'm, I know I'm accomplished. I know I've done well in my life. I know that people gravitate to me and not every guy could handle me. You're my a first husband, yeah. yeah, my first husband could not handle me. <laughs> so we had to go to number two. Um, but my husband, he will cheer just as loud for me as I cheer for myself. And so he's one of those people that doesn't get intimidated when I'm doing something. He's like, he's telling people about it. He's proud of me. And I think that's just really, really cool. And, you know, I have people that, man, they're in new relationships and they're crying three months into it. I'm like, man, if you were crying now, it is only going to get worse okay. because it, you're in the easy part. Okay. So, you know, the, the, the person you live with, I think is important. And then the thing that you do for a living, I mean, you have to be mentally stimulated. And you have to, I mean, and I think it's so important to understand the difference between a job and a career because a job is just checking the box. Like when I started out in my career of insurance, I became a personal trainer because I needed a job to help me get to where I was going in my career. I needed to have extra income coming in. I knew the, the trainer thing wasn't going to be something that I was going to make a profession out of. It was just checking the box and that, there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that, but you just need to understand the difference because I think when you look at a career versus a job, a career you're willing to make sacrifices for, a career you're willing to work the 80 hour weeks that I did during open enrollment, you're willing to not go on vacation, you're willing to do without because you see where you want to be headed. Um, and then as far as the place that you live, you know, and I'm not just talking about a physical structure. I'm also talking geographically where you live. Like New York City works for me. I mean, I'm from a, you know, I mean, my dad, yes, he was a general in the Air Force. We traveled around a lot, but we always had that house in King City, Missouri. And my parents let us know that the world is bigger than our backyard. Go out and explore it. But if you want to come back to the backyard, there's no shame in that. So you have to figure out what works for you. I mean, I have so many people. I mean, I was just back in Missouri for Christmas and I had all these friends that were like, oh, I could never do New York. I could never, but they've never been to New York. And, but you know, at the end of the day, it's not for everybody. You really they have probably to couldn't do it. Yeah. yeah. And that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that, but just understanding, you know, they're very happy in Missouri, Missouri. I love Missouri and I will always have a big love for Missouri, but it doesn't work for me. You know, and I learned that I went back for six months for a job in 2003. And that's when I learned it wasn't going to work for me professionally. Yeah. I feel the same way about my hometown. I grew up in Orlando, Florida, and I always say yeah. it's a great place to be from. 
So, but yeah, so that's, that's the three facets. I like the three facets one too. It's a good one. Yeah. I love it. I love it. It's a great framework. Let's move on to another one that I really liked and it's totally in line with uh, today's dadage uh, to thine own self be true. You simply put it, know yourself. And you talked in the book about embracing what makes you unique. And also then, and I love this part, once you recognize what makes you unique, then embrace the value of diversity among your friends, your value of diversity among activities and everything that you're doing in your life and everything you make a part of your life. And then you went on to say, don't put all of your expectations on any one person to fulfill all of those different aspects of yourself. Can you talk about that some more? Because I found it such a beautiful message and so important. Yeah. You know, I think it is unfair. You know, you hear people say, oh, my spouse is my everything. Oh, they're my best friend. They're my everything. That is too much pressure to make one person your everything. And I mean, and it can even go to person, places, things, you know, jobs, careers, like you can't make one thing fulfill all aspects of your life. And I think that is so, so important. And understanding who you are. I mean, it kind of goes back to like, you know, some of you guys might remember the runaway bride, you know, Julie Roberts, how do you like your eggs? And she liked her eggs the way that the guy she was with. And I, some people won't agree with me on this, but I think that women change tremendously between the ages of 23 and 26. So my little cousins know that the rule is you can't get married before 26. I would almost push it to 30, but because I think that I look at the, the first marriage I was in, I was like, oh, you like that? I like that. Oh, you like to do that? I like to do that. You want to get up on Sunday morning at 6 a.m. every single Sunday and go hiking? Oh, yeah, I like to do that. I fucking hated it, you know? <laughs> <laughs> but I did it. I'm being but honest. It, yeah, I'm being honest. I mean, but I did it. And it's just like, and I lost myself yeah. because I don't think I really knew who I was. And then after, you know, after that marriage ended and my, my husband, Sean, and I, we've been together, um, gosh, uh, in 2024, it'll be 20 years. I remember my mother saying to me, she said, you know, you're kind of out there with him and you kind of kind of lay it all on the light. I said, you know what? He's never going to come back to me and say, I didn't know you felt this way. I didn't know you didn't believe this. I didn't know you didn't want that. And I think sometimes people are so afraid, especially in early relationships, they're so afraid of really being themselves because they don't want to scare off the the prospect, so to speak. But man, you can weed it out a lot quicker if you're just like, hey, if you're a person that doesn't want to have children, freaking put that out there pretty quick. Don't waste their time. Don't waste your time. I mean, it's just like, because you're not going to change your mind on that probably. So unless it's something that you're on the fence about, then that's one thing to discuss. But I think that really understanding who you are and like with business, understanding what you like to do, what you don't like to do. Um, and then like we talked before, bringing in the people that are good at doing the stuff you don't like to do. I mean, it doesn't mean that you... You know, you have to be a grown up sometimes and do the shit you don't want to do. But if it's like a consistent thing, you'll you'll be a lot happier if you're bringing, bringing the right people too. For sure, it's it's fundamental to finding happiness. And I enjoyed what you said about you know the growth in yourself as an individual and how it impacted your romantic relationships in your life. I can very much relate to that. I went through a lot of evolution uh, during my twenties. And I was married very young. I got married at 24 years old. Uh, my first wife and I, my roommate in college moved out on graduation weekend and she moved in the same day. You know, I went through a lot of evolution during that yeah. time period and she didn't. And yeah. that's okay. I mean, we went to couples therapy. What she said to me was, well, I haven't changed since the day you met me. You've changed. And I said, you're right. Yeah. And that was like with my first one too. Yeah. yeah. And that's just the way it was. And it's kind of like business partnerships too. I always say that it's mm -hmm. challenging to develop long lasting business partnerships because you may be looking the same direction, have the same goals when you start out, but to be able to stay on the same trajectory for a decade or more, mm -hmm. it's more likely that one of you is going to change trajectory and at some point that partnership isn't going to align. And I think it's very much the same way with marriages, unless, as you said, you can be completely open and honest. I have very strong woman in my life. My wife, her motto is, I'm completely flexible as long as everything goes my way. So <laughs> there's never a risk that I don't know what she wants to do at any given moment. And what her opinion is about anything. And I value yeah. that so much. Some yeah. people might consider it difficult. I consider it the easiest thing in the world because I always know. Yeah, I know. I had a girlfriend that actually told me a couple of days ago. Um, she said, oh, 
I love that I always know where I stand with Susan Combs. Like <laughs> she said, she said, everybody knows. Like, and, and that's the thing. I feel like, I don't know. I mean, and I know I'm a strong personality. I know I can be a bitch, but it's just like, but I don't say something behind somebody's back that I don't say to their face, you know, type of thing. So it's just like, I'm always very honest. So it's like, I'm not going to be somebody, if you ask me my opinion on something, I'm going to tell you my opinion on something. Um, if you, and but I will say that I try to be good about, because I can be more like a guy, like I'm a fixer. I will fix your problem and I will tell you how to do it and everything like that. But what I try to do is when somebody comes to me with a problem, because I get that a lot, I always say, what are you wanting me to do here? Are you wanting me to just listen to you vent? Or are you wanting some suggestions? Are you wanting some advice? So I try to, it doesn't mean I'm, I always do that, um, but I, I try to do that. And then if I catch myself not doing that, then I back up and say, hey, I'm sorry, I just started fixing your problem and I don't even know if that's what you wanted. So I do try to be cautious with that. No, I, I do the same thing. When somebody comes to me to talk about problems, I'm very clear up front. Do you want the answer or do you want me to listen? That's a really good policy. And you had a lot of really, really good wisdom in your book about these interpersonal relationships and, and things like that. And along this same topic, one of the other sayings you had that I really liked is believe in love, even if it's at third sight. What is love at third sight? Oh. <laughs> well, I was married when I met my second husband. I will say that my first husband wasn't a bad guy. He wasn't. He served his purpose. He gave me some structure when I needed some structure. And like to your point with your first wife, I was the one that changed. He didn't. He was exactly the same person when I met him. And I met my, my husband, Sean. I met him at a Manhattan Chamber of Commerce networking event. You know, I wasn't looking for anything. I was married, right? So it's just like, so... We were just talking, networking, talking about each other's businesses. Then like a month later, we ran into each other again and, you know, we, we talked some more and then we got together for a networking one-on-one -on -one coffee that lasted like two hours. And then I was like, Oh, what, what's going on? Like, what, what is this? And then I started thinking about myself and I started, I think, valuing myself more and started thinking about like, Hey, I could get a guy like this if I wanted to get a guy like this. And I have a husband that's unemployed and living off me at home. <laughs> So I was like, what are, what are we doing here? pretty easy math, I guess. Yeah, I know. And I literally, I put together, this is more information than I usually give people. Yeah. I put together a happy hour and um, with some of my, my guy friends and girlfriends. And I said, hey, I want you to talk to this guy, but, but don't talk to this guy. Like he's the licked cookie. I just want your opinion. I don't know what I'm going to do here. Ears and, open, hands off. <laughs> yes, exactly. Oh, I like that. Ears open. <laughs> and all my friends loved him. And I went to a rooftop in New York city and I was with a couple of girlfriends and one girlfriend was British and her, her boyfriend called and she's like, Oh, Luke, I can't talk right now, honey. Susan's either going to have an affair, or leave her husband. And, <laughs> and then I, I heard it. I heard it. Yeah. And literally I left that hap Like I left the rooftop. I took a train home to White Plains, New York. My husband picked me up and in the drive there, I said, I'm done. This is it. Yeah. I'm, I'm done. Yeah. And he was just like, what? And I said, I just, I said, I'm not happy. I want out. Yeah. And I mean, it's amazing uh, when you look back on those end uh, of relationships. Thank God. Moments. Right. Yeah. yeah. Thank yeah. God. When you look at it in hindsight, you can see the whole chain of events that led up to that drive home. Yeah. But at the same time, there's always that one moment, you know, you, yeah. something causes you to arrive at that one moment when yeah. it's just the right thing to do. Yeah. And it's just like, and you know, and it, it hurts to hurt people. Right. I mean, yeah. it just, it does. I mean, if you're not an asshole or a narcissist, it hurts to hurt people. And yeah. so I heard him. I mean, because yeah. again, he, you know, I changed, he didn't, I mean, he's, he's remarried and he's had, you know, a, a kid and things like that. And, and I, and I hope he's happy, you know, and I'm sure he is um, because. I guarantee you left, you created the space by leaving for him to move on and have a better life as well. Well, and to find somebody that wants to go hiking at 6 a.m. Yeah. every Sunday. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Well, this is, thank you so much for being so transparent. Got, got a skeleton out of me, Chad. Yeah, no, it's, it's amazing. Thank you for sharing. It, it, it's very meaningful and, and I appreciate it very much. And I'm sure that the friends and family do as well. Let's uh, move on now and talk about the bigger picture, not just the book, but the movement, what the book has really turned into. There's 
hashtags pancakes hashtag pancakes for Roger. Uh, I looked on your website. There's a pancake map that shows map of pancakes all over the world. And now you've got a dragon slaying competition that you're going to be doing this year. Tell us about some of, more about some of these pieces of the pancakes movement. Yeah, so so we're going to have two dragon slaying competitions in February. One's going to be February 4th in New York, or more specifically Queens, New York. Okay. And then we're going to have one February 10th in Kansas City, Missouri. So I've had other gyms that are like, hey, we want to do it. Can we do it? And I said, it's the first time we're doing this. We need to kind of start out slow, do it right, because that's how I roll is like, I, I don't um, walk before you run. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So I'm just like the next year, you know, in 2025, we can look at expanding it or doing some virtual stuff. So yes, we're running our first dragon slaying competitions. And it's, you know, since Pancakes Roger is now a non-for-profit, you know, we're charging fees. And then the plan is a, a minimum of 30% of the registration fees are going to go to yeah. the veterans clinic at the University of Missouri, you know, and then we'll, we'll see. So it's just like, so we've earmarked a, a third for expenses and then a third for like prizes, men and women. Um, so it's going to be separate divisions for men and women. And we're going to have scaled and, you know, in CrossFit, we call it RX or like the prescribed weights. The top winners on those are going to get cash prizes too. So we've been getting Great. some sponsorships. So we've outlined sponsorship packages and we've aligned them with military. So we have like devil dogs and snake eaters and got your sixers. And, you know, it's just kind of cool that we're, we're incorporating really cool. kind of that part of my life too. And for people that aren't quite ready to go slay dragons yet, but are more than happy to sit down Support. and have some pancakes. Uh, if they think about Roger when they're having pancakes, what should they do? So, okay. So two things I'll say. Okay. So we do have people that are like, because I'll tell you, our shirts for the dragon slaying competition are freaking badass. And so it's, it's think about like the coolest, most buffest turquoise dragon. I'm, I'm calling him Axel. I <laughs> named him Axel. So Axel you know, turquoise Axel and his barbell, the plates are pancakes. So it's pretty going to be a pretty sick t-shirt. So if you can't um, come to Kansas City or New York, but you're like, hey, let me support with buying a dragon sling, you know, shirt or sweatshirt, you know, we do have them on the website, pancakesroger.com or like the month of February, if you want to enjoy some, some pancakes and use the hashtag pancakes Roger. We also have social media channels. We have Facebook and we have Instagram. So if you have a private account, um, make sure that you tag, you know, at Pancakes or Roger in your uh, Instagram stories so that we can okay. still see the pictures and count them. Because that's the thing that we found that it's like, even if you use the hashtag, if you don't have a public profile, we can't pull them. Um, it. So it's just like by having the social media, we think that's going to be a lot easier um, to count it. But we're we're super excited on seeing what the donation is going to be. I think last year we ended up with about $7,500 um, towards the clinic. Yeah. So we'll we'll see what ends up being this year. I think it'll be bigger, bigger and better than ever is the plan for sure. That's fantastic. I do want to talk about another aspect in the book and you don't necessarily delve into it a hundred percent, but it's underlying the, the whole story of the book, obviously, is the loss of your father. After I've experienced a lot of my friends in the last year or so, you know, we're, you and I are getting to that age now, right? Where we're losing parents, we're losing people that are close to us. Having been exposed to their loss, I've seen people deal with it very differently. And it sounded like for you, you were super close with your father. The loss of your father really had a major impact on your life. I have a friend as an example of the same thing. One of his friends said, you were so close to your mother and the grieving process you went through as she died of cancer during the couple of months leading up to her death. And then he's been going through a grieving process after her death. It'll probably take him a year or more. He said, I envy the pain that you have because it shows that that person meant that much to you in your life. My relationship with my own parents is not close enough for me to ever experience that same pain and that same loss. What do you think it is that determines how somebody deals with a loss like this in their lives and whether it does impact them that much? And what would you say to those who feel the most impacted by the loss of a parent? I guess one of my dad's dad is just um, would be that kind of resonated when you were talking there is before my dad went on hospice and we were having that discussion as a family, oh, it, was, it was freaking gut wrenching. It was so hard. And my dad said, it hurts so much because we've loved so much. I don't know any other way. I think, and again, everybody's different. Everybody deals with grief differently. There's no timeline for grief. There's no wrong way to grieve. It just, you got to do what, what works for you. But I think that some people with their grief, I think they grieve on what could have been. 
my oldest brother was from my dad's first marriage and my dad and him weren't close. And when I see him grieving, I think he's grieving the thought of how he wished he could have showed up more and maybe had a stronger relationship. I mean, my oldest brother is a severe manic depressive, so he's kind of limited that way. But, you know, in my brother, Matt is prone more to kind of feeling deeper in, de in depression. We all handle things differently. My whole thing is like move a muscle, change a thought, you know, and my dad was like that too. My dad would go out on the farm. He would do work. You know, it's just like, I'm a big believer if, you know, it's like the definition of insanity from Einstein, right? You know, it's repeating the same thing over and over, expecting something different to happen. It's not going to happen. I mean, and when you lose your dad or you lose your mom, or you lose somebody close, nobody gives you a freaking sign that says, Hey, be nice to me. I lost my dad. But you know what? I talked about it a lot and I would tell people. You know, and I was just honest. I mean, I wrote a lot. I wrote a lot. And I was very fortunate. I write for a magazine called Benefits Pro. And they gave me some really good space to write some pretty beautiful articles that I'm proud of. That basically I said, hey, if you're going to be in my shoes at some point, here are the things I wish I had known. The writing was very cathartic for me. So I think for a lot of people, you have to find what's healing. And I will tell you, like the... I feel like there's this whole underground club when you lose somebody close that you don't even know exists until you're there. I have one girlfriend that lost her dad when we were in high school, but other than that, I'm the only one. And so it's just like, so the people that I would have normally gone to for help and support, I don't want to say they were, they were worthless, but they weren't worthless. I mean, they, they helped me the best way they could, but they just couldn't identify. Yeah. One of the and, things I try to teach my boys is that friends are not black and white. They're not a good friend or a bad friend. You have to understand your friends well enough to understand where they can be a good friend to you, at what moment, in what circumstance, what type of advice, what type of support can this person be depended upon for? And not every friend is the same. You yeah, understand and that's your okay. friend is so key. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and also too, like, I can't go to my mom. And, you know, where a lot of times you just think like, oh, I just wish I'd go to my mom and be the kid yeah. again. Her but bucket's it, already empty in that yeah. yeah. And so it's just like, so my, my brother Matt and I have actually gotten closer, I would say, because because we understand. But also we process things in a different way. I mean, just, I mean, a prime example of this is we found out that my dad relapsed for the second time. And it, it was like in, in a January of, yeah. um, I guess it was January 2018. Like I said, I'm not a depressed person, but that morning when the alarm went off, I did not want to get out of bed. I did not want to get out of bed, but I had to go deliver a keynote speech. And so I got out of bed because that's what my dad would have done. And we knew with that last relapse, that was the end. And so I went and gave a fucking keynote speech in New Jersey and my brother called in sick to work. And so it's just like, and he just, just kind of cocooned inside. And so everybody's different. And so I think that that's one of the things that, and I'll be honest, I can get frustrated with my mom because you know, she doesn't do a lot to change her situation or help her situation. And we are very, very different people. And so I've started saying to her, mom, I'm kind of all out of ideas here because what works for me won't work for you. So I think it's better for you to talk to somebody that's maybe also a widow that can connect with you on that level because I just can't. I don't know what it's like to be in your shoes. And so I think be, basically being able to say that to somebody kind of gives them a freedom to go talk to somebody else. And knowing, you know, like you said, you know, you said to your boys, like not every friend can help you in every situation, but knowing who to go to, um, I think is, is always very important. But again, everybody's different. I, I'm glad to be able to say that I have no regrets when it comes to the relationship with my father. I know I was a good daughter. I know I showed up when I needed to show up. I know we had a good relationship. I know, I mean, have I done some stupid bonehead shit in my life? Absolutely. Absolutely. But I know he was proud of me. And I'll tell you, when I was at church Christmas Eve, there was a guy that was a friend of my dad's. He hugged me and he said, your dad would be so proud. Of you. And so to have those people still in your life, that you can go to for that dad advice when you need it. Those have been the people that have really kind of mentored me that they have no idea how much they've helped me. And I think that's pretty cool too. Clearly, you know, I'm very, very happy, moved that you knowing yourself applied yourself to be the superhero that I described you as not only there for your family, but actually taking your grief, repackaging it and turning it into this book, turning it into the movement that you've created and continuing to move that forward and grow it and grow it and grow it to have an impact for all of us in this way. 
And now being here today, sharing it with the Datages friends and family, you just keep paying it forward. And that's why I think you're such a superhero. And I, I respect you in that regard, Susan. And you have paid everything forward so much. You know, we talk here at Datages a lot about generational transference, uh, transference of knowledge, transference of wisdom, transference of strength, all of these things. And when we were preparing for the interview, you know, I loved what you said. And I think a lot of people can relate to this, that you have your family of origin, and then you have your chosen family. And while you yourself don't have your own biological children, you've talked a lot about your brothers. You have played a very important role as a godmother to their children. Can you tell us a bit more about that relationship and how special that is? And also how you take all of this wisdom that you've amassed and pass it on and share it to them in the next generation. Yeah. So um, I'm the godmother of one of my brother Matt's daughters, his oldest one, Josie. And my husband's the godfather of Evie, his little one. And then I have uh, two godsons from my my girlfriend, Carly, that's actually a judge and she married my husband and I, and wow. yeah, so they're, they're, yeah, they're good kids. But you know, I was just in Missouri for Christmas and Josie, the six and a half year old, she just got a student of the week this in December and she beat out 10,000 students, over 10,000 students. Wow. And it was a real big deal, real big deal. And her mom was there. My brother was home with the other one because she was projectile vomiting. And so he couldn't go be there to celebrate, you know, as we know. Isn't that the after. life of a parent? Right I there. know, yeah. divide and conquer, right? Yeah. And so Josie started crying and kind of hiding behind her mom when she got that award. And I saw the pictures later and you could tell she had been crying. When she and I were in the kitchen, I said, I want to talk to you. And she said, okay. And she's, she's a, a deep thinking kid and she pays attention and she catches on. And I said to her, I said... It looked like you were crying when you got that award. I said, why, why were you crying? And she said, well, I was embarrassed and I don't like people looking at me. And I just, and I said, Hey, I said, you're a Combs woman. I said, we win shit. I was like, we, oh, I didn't say shit to a six year old, but I was like, we win stuff. I was like, I said, aunt Susan's won a lot of awards. And I said, it's really cool. And I said, because when you win an award, I said, there may be somebody else in your class that you're encouraging them to do good so that they could win an award too. And I said, so when you win an award, I said, you just smile and you say, thank you. And I said, when somebody, I said, a lot of people are going to know that you got student of the week out of that entire school district. I said, so when somebody says, Josie, I heard you got student of the week. That's so great. I said, what are we going to say? She's like, thank you. I said, yes. And I said, you look at them in the eye. And so it's those little things that it's just, you know, she takes to heart. She does. And it's really kind of cool to be able to see those things because she's, Oh, she's, it's funny because those girls are so, so different. So, so different, but she's, I can see the perfectionism and I can try to be a perfectionism on things, um, which I think can sometimes be to your detriment, but we kind of talk about those things and talk about greatness and talk about, you know, like she'll whisper to her mom. And I said, you need to speak up. I said, you have a voice. You need to speak up if there's something you want. She wanted a recipe. I made some sweet rolls for um, for breakfast and she liked them. And she was whispering to her mom that she wanted her mom to ask Aunt Susan for the recipe. And I said, what would you like? Is there something you would like? Tell me what you want. You don't want if you don't, you know, you don't get if you don't ask. So just kind of trying to give little lessons to the little people too, in ways that they can kind of understand them to encourage them to kind of take, you know, slay their own little dragons. Maybe they're slaying lizards right now. Absolutely. Um, slay those baby like, dragons. Yeah, exactly. And that's such a beautiful illustration of being a godmother, the role yeah. of the bonus parent. Yeah. In my family, my wife is a stepmother to my boys and she's able to have conversations, to say things to them, to break things down with them that you can't as the biological parent. And you could get frustrated about it as a biological parent. Well, why won't my kids listen to me the way they'll listen to somebody else? But there's so much wrapped up in that family dynamic of the biological family that there's so many pieces of emotion you can never break free from that can actually constrain your ability to have certain kinds of conversations in certain important moments with your children. And so I really love that those stories. Mm -hmm. And I hope that anyone in the friends and family that is a bonus parent and finds themselves, whether they're a godparent or a step parent or just a mentor and a role model mm -hmm. to, to children that are not theirs biologically, I hope they can understand and value the position that they have and the impact that they could have 
by following your example and, and having those kinds of discussions with children. It's, it's beautiful. Well, this has been a wonderful discussion. I've really enjoyed it. Like I said, I think you truly are a superhero and you have a super fan in me. We at the Dadages would love to keep tabs on everything that you're doing with Pancakes for Roger, with your dragon slaying competitions, mm -hmm. with everything you have going on, because it's exciting and, and we want to be a part of it. We want to follow it and continue to bring your story to our friends and family so that they can be a part of it. So please do keep us posted as, as, you, as you go forward. And one of the other things that we love to do here at Dadages is um, we honor the legacy of the bad dad joke or the bad mom joke or the bad godmother joke, as the case may be. And you have shared with me offline <laughs> a very funny joke that is related to some of the things we've talked about. It's a little risque for some of our audience's ears. What I'm going to do to give them the opportunity if they opt in to hearing that joke is we're going to record it right after this episode. We'll make it available through our social media with the appropriate parental advisory on it <laughs> and make that available to them. And uh, I, I will say that your joke was about HR related topics. And I have a dad joke as well that I brought today that I can share with uh, the friends and family a little on the uh, cleaner side, but it is still about HR and it's also about pancakes, believe it or not. So uh, Susan, have you heard that since COVID restaurants are having a really, really hard time keeping breakfast cooks on staff to flip pancakes? No, I haven't. Yeah, they have a really high turnover rate. Oh God, that was bad. <laughs> Mine's better. <laughs> I know, I know. Yours is much better, but like I said, the friends and family are going to have to go to our social media to check out your joke. Well, Susan, this has been a delight. It's been a lot of fun. Uh, like I said, please uh, keep us posted about everything related to pancakes in the future. We've really enjoyed having you. Thank you for being Thanks here. so much. It's been a lot of fun. And until next time, I'll remind the Dadages friends and family, Dad may not always know what he's talking about, but he sure can sound like he does. <laughs> <laughs>